And welcome to this very special, very royal, and very coronation-based episode of Postcast. If this is your first time listening, then first of all, welcome and thank you for tuning in. And I am pretty sure you're wondering what the hell this is. Well, let me give you a brief explanation. Think of this post postcast. I nearly said it then. Think of this podcast like your local community notice board, but just for your ears. We will, of course, be highlighting some of the amazing work done in this community by the many volunteers and small businesses and just everyday folk that make this place a wonderful place to work, play and relax. But anyway, enough about what will be and more about what is now. In this episode, we will be focusing on all the events that have happened over this last weekend to celebrate the coronation of King Charles III. This event, steeped in years and years of history, led to some amazing events all up and down the parish. I will also be giving out some interesting trivia about the local area, some local history and some little tidbits that tie us back to the royal family. Anyway, enough diddy dallying, let's begin where all good celebrations must, which is at a good set of decorations. Mysteriously popping up around Pevensey on lampposts and signs have appeared small Union Jacks. These little flags can create an interesting spotting game, which makes you look closer to the details in this lovely little village. I'd like to take some time to highlight this usually over or underlooked memorial to Queen Elizabeth II, located just outside the east gate of Pensy Castle and outside the tea rooms. This plaque was put in place to celebrate the visit that the late Queen had to Pevensey to celebrate the 900th anniversary of the Norman landings. Local residents were encouraged to use this place as a memorial to remember the Queen by laying flowers and other things that they deemed respectful. Lastly, we move on to my personal favourite set of decorations that have been spotted in the parish which are these wonderful royal scarecrows which include king on the bike going off to who knows where probably having a little trip down to the beach and this wonderful king minion these add some lovely personalities to the village and acts as a great alternative to strung up bunton which is a great full circle to the beginning of this video if you'd like to see these decorations for yourself i would encourage a walk around the village whilst you still can actually see them or alternatively, you can watch the video where I go around and look at the decorations right now, which is on my YouTube channel. If I've done this correctly, and you're watching or listening to this on YouTube, there should be a little thing popping up in the right hand corner of your screen, so which will take you directly to that video. If you're listening on SoundCloud, I will have the link put in the description where you can also watch a multitude of different video videos sorry, from around the parish about a whole array of things. Now, I don't think it's fair to talk about the royal family and coronation without talking a little bit about feelings and thoughts and emotions that might come up when thinking about this institution. Now, I think we've seen it a lot recently, 
the massive divide between anti-monarchists and monarchists, or royalists and anti-royalists, however you would like to say it. I personally think that this fits on some kind of spectrum. Um, I know we hear that sort of word a lot, but bear with me here. And I think we're all sort of, like, on a pendulum, really, and it depends on, you know, the like your age, your upbringing, it will depend on your views on the royal family. Um, um, I for one know someone, and I know that he'll be listening to this, I can't say his name, um, but yeah, I know that he'll be listening to this, and he knows who he is, um, but I know someone who is a very big royalist, very patriotic, um, you know, will stand up and salute at the football games when they're singing uh, God Save the Queen, or should I say God Save the King now? Obviously, that's changed. Um, but yeah, he'll do all that. I mean, I've done that as well, but yeah, he'll do that. Um, so yeah, very, very, very big royalist. Um, there are many places across the parish where you could have watched the coronation, one of which being the Aqua Club, local uh, bar and restaurant very family friendly which is situated on the beach in the village in Pevensey Bay. I was lucky enough to head along there to cover the festivities and what was going on. I am here at the Aqua Club's Coronation Watch Along where there are currently not that many people but there should hopefully be more to sit on the colourfully decorated chairs with the union jacks and bunting all around. Another bit of interesting decoration is this fairly creepy and sinister cardboard cutout of King Charles III that is currently staring into my soul. <laughs> On every TV screen left, right and centre and through the speakers blares the audio and visuals from the medieval celebration of course the ceremony itself dates back all the way to medieval times as opposed to the weddings and other such state events that we've already had they're updated but this coronation dates all the way back to the medieval period in fact actually the first coronation was done in Westminster Abbey in 1066 actually which I think links perfectly back to here considering, you know, William the Conqueror, Pevensey Castle and the Battle of Hastings. Something that is quite striking actually about this coronation and the coverage of it is obviously it's in colour. Um, when the Queen was coronated back whenever that was, I don't have the date off the top of my head, I should, but I don't. <laughs> um, I'll probably put that in somewhere. Um, but obviously that was in black and white, and it was in the very early days of TV even. Um, so there wasn't really that many, like, coverage of it. It's so beautiful to see all the colours, especially of this um, carriage that's going by currently, which is, like, covered in a bunch of gold and brown, and it just really pops out the screen. I think it gives it that more vibrancy. More well, people have come pouring into the aqua now, as you can probably hear, due to the um, raised ambience and raised noise. Hopefully it's not too loud and hopefully you can still hear what I'm saying. But more people have come in their fancy hats, flowers and even suits and waistcoats and ties and all that fancy stuff. But there's also people like myself who have come in comfy and, well, yeah, comfortable clothes, I guess. Another interesting point about the people that's in here actually is the mix of people. There's obviously, you know, the Aquas regulars. Um, you know who you are if you're listening. Um, but there's also, you know, people that I haven't necessarily seen in here before um, from all different age ranges as well, some young, some old. It's just br b brilliant to see more people come out. I've got to make a comment on this, what I've just seen. Um, in the roads in London, they have covered up the potholes by putting what I think is sand in there or something like that. It is very comical to see. Obviously, one thing that the this ceremony and, um, what's the word, uh, coronation, that's it, brings in is religion. And this year is a little bit different because um, Charles wants there to be as many um, religions as there possibly can be, you know, bringing together people 
from you know Buddhism, Christianity, and so on and so on and so on. It's actually great. I think that shows more of a reflection of the time now compared to when the Queen was coronated and how the world has become a little bit more diverse and welcoming of people from all sorts of backgrounds. Now something that is interesting is that this is the first time ever that the public has been urged to swear allegiance to the king as opposed to the king swearing allegiance to us. It's interesting because there's been a lot of buzz actually on social media of a lot of people who are actually fairly royalists with actually saying that they don't actually want to do that. Um, so I guess that's a big question this time around. Will you or have you pledged your allegiance to the king? A lovely comfortable corner of like sofas, chairs, pillows, everything that they can find has been assembled in the corner in front of the TV. And there are people that are very happy, smiling away, sitting with their cups of teas and little spoons, watching the ceremony unfold. And whilst this is a day of celebration, of course, you know, we're coronating a new king, um, you know, we've moved that one step closer. It's also a day of reflection and remembrance for the Queen, because without her passing, today would not be possible. Um, she le led a fantastic long life, um, even some people, including myself, thought that she was a bit immortal. Um, but, you know, she managed to connect so many people from so many countries and was the, our figurehead for such a long time. But now we've got a new figurehead and let's see how he performs and what he does with all these new cordial responsibilities that have now been put on his shoulder, especially after today. The overall atmosphere on the act for today is um, friendly, welcoming, and everyone's united for the same cause, which I think is something to be said about the leaders of the Commonwealth countries as well. They've all united for this common cause to celebrate their new head of state. <coughs> You really do get this sense that this is a social event and social gathering for a lot of people down here. And I mean, it makes sense. This is a moment in history that a lot of us are not probably going to see again, you know. Um, and especially for down here, you know, the royal ties that we have. Um, of course, the Queen visited um, Pevensey and Eastbourne to celebrate the 900th anniversary of the Norman landings. Um, and there's even a picture of her getting out of a Rolls Royce outside of the old uh, the Royal Castle in Oak um, and outside the Pevensey Castle, of course. Um, there's a monument that lies there, um, which is being flowered, which is lovely, and it is beautiful to see. It blends in a little bit, but it is there, um, and is one to go look at, actually. And if there's one thing that we can say about the United Kingdom, it's that we are very good at putting on a show, a spectacle. You know, all these colours, all these um, robes and costumes and just ceremony about the whole thing. Obviously, it's been planned for a long time. Um, same was actually the announcement of um, the Queen's death, actually. That was under um, Operation London Bridge. Um, and the media have been training years and years and years for that event to happen. Um, but yeah. <laughs> as we inch closer and closer to the king actually being crowned as our king, more and more people are coming pouring in, and the social atmosphere in the Aqua is growing bigger and bigger by the second. If you're a fitter fan like me, you would enjoy the fact that Andrew Lloyd Webber actually wrote one of the uh, one of the songs that's actually being performed in the ceremony today. And here comes the most the second most important part today I think, apart from the celebrating of the coronation of course, and I am talking about unsurprisingly the snacks which are being guided and, and guarded by the cardboard cutout of King Charles the third. The sound of the choir is so spectacular and beautiful that it makes me wonder how is it like actually being in the abbey itself with all the noise and the sounds and the bellowing up. It must be so emotional. Here's the moment that everyone here has been waiting for, the crowning of the king. Just had a bit of a ceremony of our own here at the Aqua as the uncovering of the buffet food. And once one person has just come up, after a long time of it being uncovered, but once one person came up, others were sure to follow. 
There is something almost quite hypnotic and satisfying about watching these marches and how they're all moving in symmetry and the same. Their legs will move and their hands will move and they'll go up and down. It's quite hypnotic. In that audio clip there, I mentioned how the coronation and the whole structure of the celebration was steeped back right the way to medieval times. I would like to, just for a little bit, explore why that is, the different aspects of the coronation and the history that was behind a lot of what we saw on screen. Because I think, and I will admit it myself as well, I found it fairly confusing some of the aspects. So let's take a deeper dive at the King's coronation. The first thing that dates back all the way to these times was the spectacular coronation chair, which is also known as St. Edward's chair. It is believed to be the oldest piece of furniture in the UK, still used for its original purpose, and Charles was the 27th monarch to be crowned in it. It was originally made by order of England's King Edward I to enclose what was known as the Stone of Destiny, which had been taken from near Scone in Scotland. The stone, an ancient symbol of Scotland's monarch, was returned to Scotland in 1996, but was transferred back to London for use in the service. During the coronation, the oak chair was placed in the centre of the historic medieval mosaic floor, known as the Com Cosmati pavement. I know that I pronounced that wrong in front of and facing the high altar to emphasize the religious nature of the ceremony. And like I mentioned in my uh, coverage of the Aqua Watch Along, that was something that was very important to Charles as he wanted to bring as many religions as he possibly could into that coronation celebration. Of course, the building itself where the coronation was held dates all the way back to 1066 and is steeped in this medieval history. It has this gothic style that I cannot pronounce and that I am not going to try to pronounce because I already did and that went horribly. Maybe that might appear in a blooper reel that might come uh, later this year. Now the last point that I'd like to bring up that dates back to the medieval period and again if you would like to read more of this you can of course I will leave the links to everything that I have used down in the description where you can read along at your own pace to a very detailed and pictured and all this sort of thing BBC article which goes through all the information and even more. But anyway Last thing that I'd like to mention was this spectacular gold state coach built in this built in 1762 and used at every coronation seen since 1831. It has that amazing gold leafed um, decor to it. Um, the carriage itself is made of wood and then later coated in gold leaf. There are cherubs, which represent England, Scotland and Wales. It is a total of 7 metres or 23 feet long. And it weighs a whopping 4 tonnes. But anyway, more history and trivia a bit later. Let's move on to another event which happened over this weekend. Which was the quite incredible and amazing opening up of treetops a new bit of playground equipment in the walls and road recreational ground here to give us more information about the importance and significance of the rec as well as the parish's involvement in this opening up is shirley parish councillor and head of the ethel wood center um, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, who died last September. The equipment is actually called Treetops. We felt it was right to dedicate it to her. We had ordered it the day before she died, ironically. Um, but Treetops, of course, is where she was when she became Queen in February 1952. So we felt it was right to dedicate that to her. And uh, local company uh, solicitors, Barry & Co, 
pay for a plaque for us to put up on the equipment to show that we had marked that for her and her memory. And we felt it was fitting to do that this weekend. You can listen to more of my conversation with Shirley about the playground equipment and parish council's involvement and all this wonderful stuff on my channel. There shall be a link in the description to that and another card in the top right of your screens now. One thing that I will say is that it was incredible to see the amount of people that showed up for the opening ceremony as well as how much the kids that played on it and even some of the adults were enjoying it. It reminded me a lot of when I was younger, when my sister was in primary school and I was in primary school and our mum would take us to the recreational ground where we would play on the equipment. Can't bring up the royal family without bringing up our most obvious tie back to them. I am of course referring to Pevensey Castle which is owned by the organisation English Heritage. Founded in the 4th century as one of the last of the Roman Saxon shore forts, Pevensey Castle was also the landing place of William the Conqueror's army in 1066. Later, it was passed back into service as an emergency stronghold in the Second World War. If you visit, you can still see the machine gun posts camouflaged into the castle walls. You can, of course... You can, of course, go see Pevensey Castle for yourself by buying a ticket or just walking around the outside of the grounds to see the beautiful ruins and learn more about this beautiful history. There is also a 1066 walk that you can do that takes you all the way from Pevensey to Battle and Rye. It maps the walk that William the Conqueror and his army took when they landed on the beaches. Another thing to mention though, and I know that I did mention it earlier, but I will mention it again just for the sake of it. Um, Queen Elizabeth did visit um, Pevensey and Eastbourne for the 900th anniversary of the Norman landings. There is a plaque outside Pevensey Castle just near the tea rooms. Um, it did used to blend in a bit, but now there are some lovely, beautiful, colourful plants, um, which was planted by friend of the podcast and co-founder Roy. Um, I know for a fact that he'll be listening, so hi. Um, but there are there is also a lovely plaque as well, which says why it's there. I think it's time to move on to another event that happened over the weekend, or should I say actually on Monday, but I guess because it's a bank holiday, it kind of counts as a weekend, so I was sort of right. I am talking about the cream tea, which was put on by the wonderful volunteers at St. Wilfrid's Church that brought together all different volunteers in and around the community, including yours truly, um, to celebrate the wonderful work that is done. This was, of course, part of the big help out where it was encouraged to volunteer and give up your time for your local community. I also sat down and spoke to Shirley about this, which you will hear now. I'm aware that there's currently going on a cream tea event um, in St. Wilfred's Church, which is in aid of the coronation. Um, could you maybe tell me a bit about that and the funding maybe that's gone into that? Yes, um, yes, this is the big help out day today that the King has been asking people to think about volunteering. Um, and the volunteers from within the church decided they would run a cream tea for the community, which they wanted not to have to charge for. So we applied to the National Lottery Awards for all funding um, from the church hall, um, which gave us enough money to pay for it. Wanted cream tea this afternoon for nothing, and a bit of music, um, some games and some singing along uh, for the afternoon, which obviously brings the community together and also uses volunteers during the day, um, which is what the King was hoping would happen. As you could hear in that clip, there was the rehearsals of a live performance of music. Um, this was quite lovely to listen to. Um, as they were fairly new to live performances and that sort of stuff. Um, 
But yeah, it felt, it felt nice to listen to some live music again after the pandemic and COVID has stopped us from really getting out and listening to that sort of stuff. The event was organised by Beachland's resident Tiff, who is also known as the RNLI lady. Um, this is because she opens up her garden every year to the RNLI, um, giving every proceed that she gets to that for, to them. Um, is a lovely cause that I will be sure to cover in a future episode and potentially video for the YouTube channel. Um, she was a lovely lady and you could really tell the amount of dedication and effort that her and the other volunteers at St Wilfrid's Church put into that event. One of the standout features for me personally had to be the hand-picked flowers that were put on all the tables. There was actually a raffle at the end of the event where you could win these table top decorations. I won them and gave them to someone who I know appreciates them, which is my dear old mother. I have found this quite comical and um, funny passage in an old brochure dating back to the 1970s to highlight the Pevensey Festival Week, which I would quite like to share with you now. It reads... Pevensey Bay can be described as a residential area much favoured by people in retirement and a small rural seaside resort. As such, it does not provide all the amusement and amenities of a seaside town. For this reason, it is popular with families with young children and those who want a healthy outdoor holiday, free from the noise and con congestion of larger resorts. I think that description is pretty apt and actually describes Pevensey Bay and Pevensey still to this very day. Um, if you would like to see more pictures from this, there, there is a post on my Facebook. But if you would like to also listen to more of this and hear what's inside this brochure, then leave a comment in the description. I might make a dedicated video or episode to this if there is enough people that want to see that. Now, I don't know if you watched the concert, which took place on the Sunday. Um, but I was a, like, brilliant performance all round from the likes of Katy Perry and Shooty Gatwa, who, who played Romeo in the Shakespeare Company and all that sort of collaboration in Romeo and Juliet. Um, but I was a bit disappointed, I'm not going to lie. They should have added one song, and if you're a fan of Horrible Histories, then you know exactly the one that I'm on about. It's the song that helped us learn the kings and queens and monarchs of this country. It's such a shame that I can't play it to you now because of copyright issues, but if you haven't listened to the song, I highly suggest it. It's a good barrel of laughs, and... CBBC and BBC have recently updated this track to feature King Charles III. Actually, whilst I'm on the topic of the uh, concert, why don't I say a couple facts? That stage that was used in Windsor Castle or outside of it is the biggest stage to ever be used for anything like that. It's the first time that Windsor has been opened up to the public. Um, the other concerts and events like that have been private, um, inv invite only and things of that nature. Um, the drone display, oh wasn't that so beautiful, but it was the biggest one of its kind. The display included some absolutely beautiful and spectacular displays including a whale and a bunny. It was in two locations, one above the stage outside of Windsor and the other in Cardiff Bay. You can't help it though but like stare at these drones and wonder about the technological advancements which means that we have been able to do this, you know. They are so beautiful, so spectacular. There are videos on YouTube and... BBC have posted some videos as well 
of it that you can go back and just watch all of these incredible drones do their work. I just dread to think what if someone had hacked into them. It's gone to that part of the episode where I think I should rattle off some facts that you probably don't know about King Charles III. Or maybe you do. I don't know. First interesting and a little bit unusual fact is the fact that the king appeared in an episode of ITV's drama Coronation Street. This is quite funny actually, I can imagine the king walking the cobbles and seeing the arguments which happen, which is quite a funny thing to imagine. Another interesting fact that I myself did not know is that King Charles is apparently the first monarch to go to school. Another interesting thing that's happened fairly recently is that the king and the queen consort has visited the M&S Bank Arena in Liverpool, which is the host of this year's European Eurovision Song Contest. This year marks the 67th Eurovision Song Contest, the first to be held in the United Kingdom for 25 years. The UK is hosting the event on behalf of Ukraine. During their visit, their majesty revealed this year's staging and toured the arena, meeting the creative team and this year's UK contestant, Me Merla, along the way. Majesty also met some of the hosts of Eurovision 2023, Ukraine host Scott Mills, Ryan Clark and Hannah Wenningham. Just goes to show that they've already started on their public appearances and their other responsibilities this close after the coronation. So we've heard a bit about the monarch and the king. Um, which we will obviously return to a bit later, but I think it is also important to highlight some of the palaces and royal residence that the royal family own. I'd like to start with the one that was the home of the sir, of the coronation concert. I am of course referring to Windsor Castle, which is in fact the largest occupied castle in the world. It remains a working palace today and has been a royal home and fortress for over 900 years. It's used regularly for for events which honor reciprocant which honored recipients receive their medals from a member of the royal family in the grand reception rooms. Residence is also used by the king for audiences. Receptions are held in the spectacular St George's Hall, bringing together guests from across the world to celebrate achievements and collaborate on a variety of charities and causes. Windsor Castle was often used by the late Queen to host state visits from overseas monarchs and presidents. For a state visit at Windsor, foreign heads of state enter the castle in horse-drawn carriages through the George the Sixth Gateway into the quadrangle in the upper ward where a military guard of honour is drawn up. The traditional state banquet is held in St George's Hall, which is 55.5 metres long and 9 metres wide, with a table setting seating up to 160 guests. St George's Chapel was also the home for the funeral of the Duke of Edinburgh. From Windsor we move on to the equally as recognisable and famous royal residence of Buckingham Palace. It is served as the official London residence of the UK sover sovereigns since 1937 and today is the administrative headquarters of the monarch. Although in use for the many official events and receptions held by the King, the state rooms of Buckingham Palace are open to visitors every summer. Buckingham Palace has 775 rooms. These include 19 state rooms, 52 royal and guest bedrooms, 188 staff bedrooms, 92 offices and 78 bathrooms. In measurements, the building is 108 metres long across the front 120 meters deep including the central quad 
wrangle and 24 me some performances that have been done at buckingham palace include sam Ryder, who performed his song spaceman which he did on eurovision earning him second place as well as george ezra who had to change some of his lyrics in his song to make it less risky i guess Another residence that I would like to talk about is the famous Kensington Palace. It is a working royal residence of great historical importance and it was the favourite resident of successes, successive sov, soving, sovereigners until 1760. It was also the birthplace and childhood home of Queen Victoria. Today, Kensington Palace contains the offices and London residence of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. It also contains the offices and residence of the Duke and Duchess of Gloucestershire, the Duke and Duchess of Kent and the Prince and Princess Marshal of Kent. Historic parts of Kensington pa Palace are open to the public. Kensington Palace is also home to the Royal Ceremonial Dress Collection with items of royal ceremonial and court dress dating from the 18th century to the present day. In 1689, William III bought the Jacobean Mansion Kensington Palace, originally, originally known as Nottingham House from his Secretary of State, the Earl of Nottingham, and commissioned Christopher Wren to extend and improve the house until the death of George II in 1760. Kensington Palace was the favourite resident of successive sov sovereign... S sovereigners. Queen Victoria was born and brought up in the palace, and news of her sent session in 1837 was brought to her there by the Lord Chamberlain and the Archbishop of Canterbury. However, Victoria chose to reign from Buckingham Palace. It had been expected that Victoria would reign from either Kensington or St. James's Place Palace, but almost immediately she moved to Buckingham Palace and never again stayed at Kensington Palace. Queen Mary, grandmother of the current Queen was born at Kensington Palace in 1867. The Duke of Edinburgh stayed there in his grandmother's apartment in 1947 between his engagement and his marriage. But palaces and royal residence are not the only things that the royal family have. They also have an extensive archive which houses a lot of the art and work that has gone into the royal family as well as a lot of history. This is stored in the iconic round tower of Windsor Castle. It is a unique collection of documents relating to the history of the British monarch over the last 250 years. And it preserves the personal and official correspondence of monarchs from King George III onwards, as well as administrative records of the departments of the royal household, from diaries and personal letters to account books and speeches, the collections held by the Royal Archives record and reflect some of the most significant moments in British history and provide a fascinating insight into the life and work of past monarchs, their families, households and residents. To try and upgrade these archives into the 21st century, they moved online. This was only something that has happened in the last few years and they embarked on some exciting projects. In 2012, to celebrate the Diamond Jubilee of Her Majesty, all 141 volumes of Queen Victoria's journal were digitalised, transcribed and made available online. I'll leave the website where you can find this in the description if this is something that you'll be interested in reading, I know that I sure will. In the same year, records of royal household staff from 1660 to 1924 were digitised and made 
digitized and made available online by Find My Past. And I'll leave that in the description as well. I'd like to give a couple minutes in this episode to actually bear more of a remembrance and celebration to our late Queen Elizabeth the second she lived such an extraordinary life and i think everybody knew of her face you know outside and inside the united kingdom she became such a massive figurehead such a massive importance and she was really sort of down to earth you know she had hobbies which included um her horses and horse riding and that's something that i can say is actually also quite close to my heart as well but her her majesty became hugely knowledgeable as a rider owner and breeder of horses and her passion for them was evident at the race meetings she attended publicly which regularly introduced the derby at Epsom and Royal Ascot, Royal Occasion since 1711. An insight and successful owner, an insightful and successful owner, Her Majesty often watched her own horses run and witnessed some noticeable wins. On the 18th of June 1954, her horse, Landu, I know I pronounced that wrong. If anyone wants to correct me, you can so do in the comments. Uh, won the, and I'm going to pronounce this one as this wrong as well, the Ruiz Memorial Stakes and a stall, stallion called Arolia won the Hard Wrinkle in 1957. The Queen had four winners during Ascot Week and she became the first reigning monarch to have won Royal Ascot's Gold Cup with her thoroughbred. Estimate in 2013, her horse, High Claire, fa famously won the Prix de Diane at Cheltenham in 1975. Another hobby of the Queen included dogs. She was very keen on them and, of course, had some corgis named Susan, from whom numerous successive dogs were bred. Some corgis were crossed with dash hounds, most notably Pipkin, who belonged to Princess Margaret, to create, this is a funny word, Dorgis, Dor Dorgis. and Her Majesty has owned corgis and doggies, or Dor Dorgis, sorry, ever since, I did read that as doggies. Queen obviously had many other interests as well. I think it's come to that time where I should bring this special episode to an end. As always, I would like to thank the Pevensey Parish Council for their ongoing support of this podcast. Without them, the way in which you see it and listen to it will not be possible. I would like to thank every organisation, volunteer and person that agreed to be interviewed or let me in to cover their events for the coronation and of course i would like to thank you my dear listener it really is encouraging to see the amount of support that has grown for this podcast in such a short amount of time and it is so interesting when i hear people talk about it out on the street or when people have conversations to me about this you know, that's what I want. I want this to be a very collaborative thing. And I feel like it has the exact nature that I wanted to bring to this. Another point that I'd like to bring up that I think I have accidentally forgot to bring up in the other episodes is the fact that there is an email that is open for anyone to get in contact with in the community. If you have any questions, complaints or queries about the podcast, about the parish council about any of that matter i will pass that information on to the relevant people and there might be a chance to get your answer in an episode so with that being said i've been dan middleton you've been listening to postcast and there's one final thing for me to say
God save the king.